Hey, welcome to Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air. I am Jim Grant. To my left is Eric Whitehead at the controls, as usual. Phil Grant, the editor of Almost Daily Grants, is here as well, as is the great Evan Lorenz, deputy editor of Grant's Interest Rate Observer. And today we have um, a guest, and he is uh, Stephen D. Blyberg, who is a managing director. The manager. A, a, a manager. Uh, uh, let's, 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 let's go for it. <laughs> okay, a managing director and portfolio manager at Epic, which is um, an equity money management shop. Uh, shop. It's a factory, actually. $45 billion or so is factory size in a shop. So uh, Stephen is an author, a money manager, a man of many attainments, a Harvard man, of course, you can tell by looking at him as I am right now, and uh, an alumnus as well of the Sloan School of Management at MIT, where I suspect the professoriate were attempting to indoctrinate Mr. Blyberg with the tenets of modern portfolio theory. Good luck with that. You will see for yourselves a little bit later. So uh, anyway, welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Um, Stephen, I, I have in front of me uh, something called The Limits of Theory. This something is an essay. It's a, it's a wonderful essay. It excerpts ran in the current issue of Barron's, where I saw it, and you kindly sent along the whole thing, which contains... Uh, not an addendum, but um, a finale having to do with baseball. I, by the way, you, you must, you're a Red Sox fan having to do with your time in Boston? No, no. Ah, excellent. Okay. Um, I say excellent in a facetious way. If people of Boston listeners didn't really mean it. Um, I should, oh, I should mention as well, uh, this does not come to you without uh, advertising sponsorship, but we have uh, today uh, Audible which is the preeminent way to listen to a book and also by a zip recruiter. And if you're hiring, uh, think about zip recruiter. And I'll get around to those in, those in the fullness of time. But first, Stephen, what is modern portfolio theory and what's wrong with it? Well, it's a, it's a body of theory, really, goes all the way back to the 1950s, started with um, Harry Markowitz, you know, who later won a Nobel Prize for this work. He did his PhD thesis at the University of Chicago on a topic that was uh, portfolio selection. And uh, there's a famous, if possibly apocryphal, story about Milton Friedman being on the committee, on his, uh, you know, exam committee for his PhD, who read this work and said, well, this is interesting, but it's not economic. Well, is it common sense? In, in some ways, you could argue that, I mean, it's very hard for us, I think, in 2018 to go back to, you know, the, the world that people lived in, in the early 1950s, without computers and without a lot of access to data, uh, the way they thought about you know, how do you put together a bunch of stocks into a portfolio? It was it was very qualitative and not very quantitative in those days. Perhaps I had earlier asked you to tell us what MPT is, but perhaps by describing life in, say, 1968, you can tell us what it is not. So without uh, modern portfolio theory, with uh, kind of uh, retro uh, portfolio management, how would one go about thinking, for example, about the nature of a stock and the nature of a portfolio and uh, the nature of the market? How would that... Yes. Well, yeah, this is my favorite way of thinking about this, that 50 years ago, uh, when MPT was just really sort of starting to catch on, if you ask somebody, yeah, what is a stock? They would say, well, that's a stupid question. It's you, it's an ownership piece of a business. What more do you need to know? And if you're going to buy a stock, you should know something about the business. And one of the things that modern portfolio theory did was to say, well, you know, the, the specifics of an individual company don't really matter that much to your portfolio because the, you know, there's a sort of systematic component, as MPT calls it, to the risk of the stock, which is just kind of how sensitive is it to the ups and downs of the market. And then there's this, the rest of the stuff that makes the stock go up or down, and that's, quote, stock-specific risk. And what MPT says is, don't worry about stock-specific risk. You can diversify that away by holding a lot of stocks, and therefore, you're not going to get paid for that risk. You know, the markets aren't going to pay you for risk you don't need to take. Uh, and so don't worry about stock-specific risk. I think what's happened over time is that the, the thinking has sort of morphed, I think, without people even realizing it from, well, that doesn't necessarily matter to the riskiness of the portfolio, to that stuff doesn't matter at all. You know, it doesn't matter to the stock price. Well, of course it matters. <laughs> to the stock price. So that's part of it. And then what makes the market go up and down? Well, so, you know, MPT takes this view of, well, there's this thing called the, quote, equity risk premium. Again, a very abstract concept. I mean, that's sort of my criticism of MPT is that it's too abstract. And it is sort of the unintended consequences that has gotten people away from remembering that, you know, this is a real world that we deal with. And when you buy stocks, you buy an actual business. You're not just buying some collection of, of statistics. What a crazy idea that is, buying an actual business. Hey, Stephen, in the beginning of this essay, you uh, you compare uh, MPT a little bit in the thrall of MPT with the uh, this wonderful Tom Wolfe book of 1975, the, the Painted Word, in which Wolfe says that after he read this uh, 
kind of slightly opaque notion of Hilton Kramer's that actually you need a theory to uh, to watch a painting. And Wolf said, you know, it used to be seeing as seeing believing, and now it's believing as seeing. And you liken this to uh, to MPT in the stock market. Could you explain the comparison? Yes. Well, so, you know, Wolf's book, which, as you say, came out in 75. And the whole point of the book was that, you know, in his view, painting had become a literary medium. That's what the, the title of the book refers to, the painted word, that artists were no longer concerned with making a painting to illustrate some concept of having to do with history or beauty or something or truth. It was, it was all about illustrating theories of art that were really only understandable to other people who were versed in the same thing theories. And so art kind of lost its connection to the man on the street, so to speak. People look at modern art in many cases, and they don't really know what to make of it because they don't really understand. They, they, they're not even aware of what it was the artist was trying to communicate. And then he wrote a similar book in 1981 about architecture called From Bauhaus to Our House. And I read that when that came out because I was actually still in college taking a class on American architecture. And so I was quite interested in it, then went back and read The Painted Word. And then a year later, I found myself in business school starting to study finance and learning about modern portfolio theory. And it just struck me at the time, this is the same thing. Here's this activity, which is you know really grounded in the real world, real businesses. And yet it's, it's becoming, it's turning into this very abstract, very theoretical realm. Well, in this in this terrific essay of yours, I'm talking with uh, Stephen Blyberg, the author of uh, what you call it, the limits of theory. In this essay, you say, in finance as in art, the theory has become the main story. So, in finance, it's not just theoretical. This theory becoming the main story. It is actually uh, the source of the destiny of hundreds of billions of dollars, oh, yeah. which are uh, chugging into index funds because people have learned, uh, perhaps at second or third hand, but they have imbibed the notion that the market, the entire market, is the place to be, and not right. Uh, right. All right. So you are in the business of uh, of buying low and selling yeah. high with respect to individual securities. Mm -hmm. So you are it's like you're part of the uh, the proverbial uh, x percent who don't get the word Stephen. <laughs> so is this essay in some shape a cry for help a cry for the understanding of the investing public that the mpt inspired indexation boom has reached beyond the limits of reasonableness to some extent yeah i think that i mean it's a difficult subject because um so let me back up for a second yeah mpt tells you you should own the market and to accept that, though, you have to, there, there's a key assumption, simplifying assumption in MPT, which is that we all agree on what constitutes risk. Yeah. And, and specifically, it has to do with the variability of the returns of, of any asset, a stock, a portfolio, and that you can measure, you can capture risk with this one measure called standard deviation or, or variance. And that therefore, since that's an objective number, it's not a subjective thing, we would all agree on what the riskiness of any stock or any portfolio is. And if you go with that assumption, if you, if you accept that and move on from there, MPT will demonstrate, well, there's this one portfolio, we don't know what's in it, but there's one portfolio that's on optimal in terms of if you combine it with cash, depending on how much risk you want to take, you can get the best payoff for any given level of risk. Well, what, what would be in that portfolio? Well, what's the only, if it was truly optimal, we'd all want to hold it. Well, what's the only portfolio that we can all simultaneously hold? It has to be the whole market, because if any one of us is overweight something, somebody else has to be underweight. So the only thing we can all hold at the same time is a little miniature version of the overall market. You know, Stephen, I, I have heard it said so often that, uh, that risk is volatility or risk is variance. I mean, Fine, I, I went to uh, a school in the Big Ten. But isn't risk like losing your money? Yeah, well, so this used to drive me crazy when when I was er earlier on in my career in the business and people would say, oh, you know, standard deviation doesn't capture risk because risk is really about losing money. And I used to think, ah, but you know, if I tell you that something has an expected return of 10 and a standard deviation of 20, that tells you exactly how often, what percentage of the time the return will be less than zero. So I used to think, well, I am telling you about the possibility of losing money. What it doesn't really get get at, though. And this is, I think, the really key critique of now, it. Now, what doesn't get at? My simple-minded no. assertion? Oh. No, no. The idea that if you have the expected return and the standard deviation, you know, you could just draw a bell curve around that average return, and you could see how much of that bell curve lies below zero, and that would tell you, oh, okay, so, you know. Don't use margin. Well, yeah. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that what that way of thinking that you're capturing downside risk simply through standard deviation misses is this concept of there's an asymmetric loss aversion function. This is something that behavioral finance Finance has, has brought to our attention that well, happen, yeah. we, we don't all see risk the same way. Behavioral finance, fooey. I mean, this is this is the wisdom of the ages, right? I mean, well, behavioral I'm, finance. I mean, yeah. I mean, as opposed to what mechanistic finance or, or robotic finance. Anyway, uh, may, uh, may I, Stephen, may I interrupt this for one second? Yes. I have some business to conduct here. This has to do with uh, with our sponsor, the Sainted Sponsors, and this one is Audible. 
which has an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more. Get a free audiobook with a 30-day trial at www.audible.com slash grantpod. That is, to say, a free audiobook. Now, um, Audio is offering our listeners this free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audible.com slash grantpod and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. The featured book that we are offering, that is the audio and grants, we're offering The Life of Samuel Johnson by James Boswell. Now, this this is not exactly a how-to financial book, but it is the first and perhaps still the greatest biography ever written. Yeah, the first of its kind, really, modern biography, and I say the greatest to this very date. And you're probably wanting an excerpt. All right, here is Johnson through the ears and pen of James Boswell on the trade that I practice. Here we go. Quote, no man but a blockhead ever wrote except for money, period, close quote. True, except that is the worst prediction in the history of the world. Everybody is writing for no money. So Audible, go to audible.com slash grantpod or text grantpod to 500-500 to get started. And uh, Evan, you want to... Uh, Stephen, you, you talked about the um, asymmetric feeling of risk. When you when you lose something, you feel a lot worse than when you gain something. However, still using standard deviation to measure risk still seems to, to miss something because last year, the VIX, which is a measure of, you know, the volatility of, you know, the S&P uh, future options was like 10 or below for almost the whole year. And this year, it's been above 20 the whole year. So was the market like half as risky last year as it is this year? I mean, it seems like it's still the same kind of market. Um, well, so, you know, what VIX is measuring is is the implied volatility in the market based on options prices. So in a sense, yeah, a year ago, people thought the market was not going to be very volatile and it, it wasn't for a while and then it became more volatile. So of course now implied volatility is higher. But I, I just want to go back to the, the asymmetry of the, the loss aversion point, because what it's telling us is that not everybody does view risk the same way. So the, the whole, just to explain to listeners, the, the asymmetry argument is, um, you know, as you say, uh, the, the pain of a 10% loss may be much worse than the the exact opposite of the pleasure of a 10% gain. So for, but, but it differs from investor to investor. So one person might say, gee, for me, a 5% loss is enough to offset the pleasure of a 10% gain. But somebody else might say, you know, I, I feel like an 8% loss is sort of the opposite equivalent of a 10% gain. So given that, that that differs from person to person, the, the implication of that is when we look at a, when you get all the investors out there to look at a particular stock or a particular portfolio, they are not going to see its riskiness the same way. And so if that's the case, then the whole assumption that there's one optimal portfolio for everybody, which has to be by logical deduction, the market kind of falls apart. And that's really the argument to me against indexing. And what fascinates me about what's happened with indexing is the unintended consequences. I'm a big fan of, you know, the whole idea of the law of unintended consequences. And what it has done over the years is it's gotten people to accept this mindset of don't even bother trying to understand the companies they're investing their money in, which just seems kind of nuts in, in a certain way. You know, I'm going to put my money in this company. Do you know anything about it? Nope, not a thing. But I don't have to. I don't need to know anything about the companies I'm investing in. That just seems a little odd. Well, yeah, but, you know, if you got the Federal Reserve with your back, Steve, everything, anything is possible. Uh, this episode of Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air has been brought to you in part by Zip Recruiter. So are you hiring, uh, posting your position to job sites and waiting for the right person to see it? So Zip Recruiter knew there was a smarter way, so they built a platform that finds the right job candidates for you. ZipRecruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right experience, and invites them to apply for your job. Now, these invitations have revolutionized how you find your next hire. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. And ZipRecruiter doesn't stop there. They even spotlight the strongest applications you receive so you never miss a great match. The right candidates are out there. ZipRecruiter is how you find them. So businesses of all size trust ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. Right now, uh, listeners to the Grants Interest Rate Observer podcast can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, F-R-E-E, -E. bang. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash grant. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash grant. ZipRecruiter.com slash grant. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. One of the uh, points in this uh, wonderful essay, by the way, uh, could one go on the Epic website and download the entire essay? Yes, you could. It's, well, uh, it's the kind of question an author doesn't, doesn't mind hearing. So please do that. When the, just if you Google Epic, just Epic alone. Uh, well, it's EIPNY.com for Epic Investment Partners. So EIPNY.com. Okay. And that, that'll get you the, uh, the tech. Yes. Okay. So you talk about, do banks actually make money? Well, of course they make money. The banks deposit. They, t they take in money. How can they not make money? Well, it turns out that from 1960 to 2000, 
2015, in the aggregate, banks did not make their cost of capital. Well, that's the key concept is the cost of capital. There's a difference between making a profit and yes. earning a good return on capital. Ah, yes. So that's the thing. I mean, I, if I, I could go out, if I'm a company and I'm generating some earnings and I then go out and I invest a billion dollars in some sort of new project and at the margin it produces another $10 of earnings. Now I could go in front of my investors. You're profitable. Exactly. It was accretive to earnings. I create, I added $10 to earnings and somebody might say, well, but you invested a billion dollars. That's all you got for it? So that was a terrible return on my invested capital. So knowing a company's earnings growth, its PE ratio, its PEG ratio, none of those things tell you anything about what a company's return on invested capital is. And one of the things I, I mentioned in the paper is, look, whatever industry a business is in, they're all trying to do the same thing. You take a dollar of capital and net of the cost of that capital, turn it into something more than a dollar. That's what a business is trying to do. And the measure of success of a business is what kind of return do they earn on that capital that they invest. So you can't just look at earnings alone and think that that tells the whole story. Stephen, you would expect, I certainly expect, that uh, with everyone seeming to ignore what is kind of patronizingly called the fundamentals, everyone in a hurry to implement MPT uh, through the magic of indexation, that this rush into the index funds would create pockets of under-analyzed, indeed orphan securities, that would afford the careful enterprising analysts, that enterprising word is one of Benjamin Graham's, the enterprising investor would earn excess returns. Is this happening yet? And if so, if it's not happened, does this not imply that we're kind of in the middle of the game of indexation? There's much more to go before the excesses are truly turned into earnings by people who actually read the documents? Well, it's hard to know the answer to that. There's certainly, uh, I mean, the percentage of money that is indexed as a percentage of all the money that's invested has gone up a lot in the last 10, 15 years, but it's still, you know, there's a more that could come too. So, but there have been some interesting studies on this. So for example, some people did some analysis of companies that are in the S&P 500 versus the ones that are not to study, like, is there a difference in their price earnings ratios? And now I just said a minute ago that those are not very meaningful statistics, but nevertheless, people have, that's what people look at. So they, they found that there was an impact that companies that are in the index tend to trade at higher multiples simply because of the fact that they're in the index and it attracts more money into those stocks. Now, can you profit from it? Well, that's a good question. If you're standing in front of this wall of money that's still going to be flowing into indexes for a while longer, you might not be able to stay solvent, uh, you know, trying to play that arbitrage. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Hmm. I mean, I, you know, I like to believe that obviously, look, we're active managers and we think focusing on these things that matter, like what is the return on capital that the company generates? That's what you need to be focusing on to identify a good business. The, the point about, you were mentioning that study about the banks not, quote, making money or not earning their cost of capital. See, that's kind of my, I, I think there's this, quote, tyranny of the index that I call it, you know, so people feel, well, you have to own the whole market. So all these big banks are publicly traded companies. I have to own them. Well, here's somebody comes along and studies them and says, you know, as a business, they did not earn their cost of capital over the last 50 years. Why, some, why would you want to own them? Some did. Some did, not all. Well, that's the, that's the point, right? Yeah, of course. Right. So yes, first of all, you, yes, you don't want to own all of them blindly because as a group, they're not earning their cost of capital. You want to find the ones that are, but this mindset of indexing, just own everything. If it's a public company, I have to own it. And, and just, you know, when well, if, I think if Jack Bogle were sitting here and uh, sometimes I wish he, I, I wish he would because he is one of the gentlemen and of course, one of the greats of the business. I think if he were sitting there, he might look at you, Stephen, and say, right, so uh, by reading the documents, thinking about things and considering the businesses uh, as businesses and judging their merits, you can do better than the market, right? And so you've done better than the market, have you, Stephen? Well, the strategy that I work on has, yeah. Um, but I, I look, well, I, that's what you want to expect from a Harvard and MIT. Yeah. Well, listen, I, you know, and I mentioned in the paper, like, like we freely acknowledge that, look, active managers have sort of given themselves a bad name over the years because they haven't on average generated, you know, better returns in the index. And that's a real issue. And that's why when we started talking about indexing, I said it's sort of a complicated issue because for most invest, well, what I would argue is, look, a lot of active managers, I would, this sounds silly, but you know, they're not doing it right is in essence, the view of if you're focusing on things like, gee, this is at a PE of 10 versus that one at 15, therefore the 10 is cheaper. Well, it's not, you know, you don't know that without knowing more about the businesses. So there are a lot of managers, I think, who, who follow processes that aren't necessarily likely to generate better than index returns, number one. But then the second issue that complicates it is if you're an individual investor, how do you evaluate managers to know which ones have a... If you're 26 years old and uh, and don't work in the uh, buy low, sell high business and uh, uh, you simply want to provide for yourself and uh, your heirs in the most efficient way, you wouldn't uh, not suggest an index fund. No. I, I certainly can't criticize people for doing it because again, it's hard. It's really hard to identify managers who can, who do have a process that's likely to work in the long run. And certainly most individual investors aren't really equipped to even evaluate the investment processes of different fund managers. Processes so important? 
or is it uh, luck, right? Well, no, I wouldn't. No. <laughs> well, look, luck does play a role. There's a lot of randomness in, in, in the right. nature of what we do. Speaking of which, okay, so the uh, this uh, a superb essay, which you can download, ladies and gentlemen, from the Epic website, uh, concludes with a kind of a rumination on baseball. And you quote the great, once marginalized, <laughs> but, uh, then uh, kind of uh, lionized statistician, Bill James. And please tell us about Bill James and please tell us about how his uh, uh, coming in from the cold, uh, what that reflects on the investment business. Well, yeah, he's sort of the equivalent of, you know, the quants and the, on, on Wall Street. Here was this guy who in the 80s would put out that book every year, the Bill James Baseball Abstract. And he did it longhand, right? Faxed it. And... That's right. Yeah. He, he kind of invented the whole, you know, science of saber metrics. It was all, he was the one who came up with all these new ways of looking at uh, baseball statistics and, and creating new statistics. And then in two... But he didn't think of exit velo. Uh, of what? I'm sorry. Exit velo. Exit, oh. exit velocity. <laughs> you have to keep up. Right, right. Um, so then in, in 2003, you know, he got hired to be a consultant with the Red Sox. And then <laughs> they went on to win the World Series yeah, the next year. Okay. Yeah, okay. And then two more the times over the next decade. So he was a, he was a guest on a, on a rival podcast earlier this year. <laughs> uh, and, and he was asked about what had surprised him most when he went from being this outsider, sort of the crazy guy in the basement, to being a consultant to the Red Sox. And his answer surprised me because you'd think, Here's a guy who, as I say, sort of the quant of the baseball world. You'd think he'd, he'd say something about how, you know, giving credit to his way of looking at the world as, as a way to, to create success on a baseball team. And what he said was actually that what surprised him most was how many people have to, how many people contribute to the success of a team to a championship to the point where it's almost incalculable, as he put it, the number of little streams flowing into that river is so many. And, and he used as an example, Dustin Pedroia and saying, well, you know, you, there's so many people who had an impact on Dustin Pedroia. And he traces it all the way back to like his little league coach and his father, that all of these people contributed to the Red Sox winning a World Series. You know, it's not what you'd expect sort of a hardcore quant to say that it's, well, it's all these people, it's really hard to capture, you know, their effect. But so that's what he said. So, you know, my, my lesson from it is it's not just understanding that Dustin Pedroia is a good player and being able to quantify that. You kind of have to understand why is he a good player? What made him a good player? And I feel for investors, it's the same thing. You can't just look at all the statistics about a company. You have to understand why is this a good company? What makes it a good company? And and that does require some, some subjective judgment. Uh, fabulous. Well, um, Stephen Blyberg, the son of Larry Blyberg, um, the great uh, progenitor of Boxwood Associates, the, uh, the nephew of Robert M. Blyberg, the editor of Barron's National Business and Financial Weekly, who was known when I served under Robert Blyberg. Um, welcome and uh, goodbye. I, 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 well, I said welcome earlier, but this has been wonderful. And um, I, I so love the way you write and the way you think. And um, people, please do uh, read uh, this terrific essay on the Epic website. So, uh, Stephen, thank you. So I'll talk to you again soon, I hope. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you.